What up? This is Caroline with the CWC podcast, where we believe that life without your favorite foods is not worth living. I'm going to be talking a lot about my journey to food freedom, and of course, I will always keep it real by sharing the good, the bad, and of course, the ugly. Welcome back to the CWC podcast. I uh, filmed, oh, my butt is so sore from working out yesterday. Um, I feel like it, it has been a long time since I filmed an episode because I, I don't even remember when it was, but a couple of months ago, I sat down and like banged out like five or six episodes in like one or two weeks like back to back and then I you know sent them all to JJ so he could work on them and of course he like had them all done rather quickly sent them all over to me so then basically I like it was before the holidays because I didn't want to like be stressed about getting podcast episodes out during the holidays so I was like oh perfect I can take like a break so I took a really long break because I had so many episodes like set to air that I was just like it I got out of the habit and now I'm like it's time to film an episode because next week is the drop. I've gone back to, um, I don't know why I feel like I have to announce this, but I do. Like I went back, I was doing weekly episodes and it's so, it's so hard to do weekly drops. Um, because a lot of time goes into me filming this and then like all the stupid, like back end shit, which is like, what I hate about everything (laughs) like like the the minute tedious details of like running a business that no one sees or like filming a podcast that no one sees like this right here is like my cake like I fucking live for doing these episodes and filming them for you guys and talking to you guys I don't live for like once this like wraps (laughs) I have to like get the memory card out and transfer it to my thing. And then I have to get the video file uploaded. And then I have to like make notes and like the intro ready. And that's all the stuff that I don't like. (laughs) I really don't like doing all of that, like getting it, but it's part of it. It's part of it. I have to put it, I have to put it together for you guys, like tell a story. So anyway, this is the fun part. Anyway, I don't know where it was (laughs) just rambling. Um, I was going somewhere with that though. And now I don't remember COVID brain. I had COVID last week and it, uh, it sucked. It wasn't terrible. I mean, it sucked. It could have been worse. I'm very thankful. Um, Josh and I both had it. I, I, the kids were home with us and they're fine. They never got it. I don't know if Bryn didn't have it before because she was sick for like two and a half weeks, but we thought it was an ear infection. So now I'm like, oh my God, what if she had it and gave it to Josh and he gave it to me? But then Kyler never got, I don't know. It is what it is. Anyway, I've been saying COVID brain because people have been talking about, like obviously it affects you mentally and they're like, oh yeah, I have COVID brain now. Like I can't think of words. Well, bitch, I'm used to that because of breast implant illness. (laughs) Like you talk about like brain fog with breast implant illness is a gazillion times worse than COVID brain. So been there, done that. Um, Anyway, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, My, the whole thing that I'm getting ready to go into is I've been getting asked a lot to do an update since my explant because it's been now, like 16 months since my explant which is so crazy because I feel like I have been sitting here doing like mini updates along the way since I did have my surgery on, you know, my symptoms. A lot of girls are like, oh my God, did your symptoms go away? Like the number one thing I get asked about is I'm, or they say, I'm so scared that my symptoms won't go away. Like I'm terrified to do the surgery, pay for it, have it. It's scary to have surgery, period take these things away that I'm now used to having. I don't feel like I'm going to look feminine anymore. I feel like I'm going to look like a boy. And then I do all of those things to still feel like shit. And that's the biggest fear. I had the exact same fear. I did not know if my symptoms were going to go away. I, and again, I've talked about this before. I didn't go into my explant like knowing a lot about breast implant illness. I really didn't. 
I went and had my explant off of a gut instinct. That is, I wasn't like researching BII and talking to women. I had no idea that any of my symptoms could have been related to that prior to explanting. It was kind of like right before. And I like, I just remember that week prior of my surgery, I, I, it was like a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, oh my God, this, this could potentially be the cause of all the shit that I've been struggling with for a year and a half or two years. I can't remember how long. Um, so anyway, I'm going to kind of start at the beginning and just tell you guys how I got to the point to where I was sick enough to know that something was kind of wrong. And then, like I said, I went off of a gut instinct to choose to have explant surgery over getting new implants put in because I had already paid for a new surgery, new boobs, silicone. So I'm going to go over that whole like crazy scenario of the light bulb moment and then everything that's happened since then. Um, I don't go anywhere now without talking about this. I, I literally was getting my hair done yesterday and my hairdresser was like, I had a lady in here the other day. She's like in her 60s. She's a teacher. She thinks that she's suffering from breast implant illness. And I was like, give her my phone number. Give her my number. Tell her to call me because she doesn't talk to anyone about it. She's in that phase where like no one believes her. Doctors can't tell her what's wrong. And she knows like she knows something's wrong. Now, here's what I want to say before I get into this. We know when something is wrong especially with our body. I feel like we know when something isn't right. And I knew for a long time something wasn't right. So um, where do I want to start? I got to try and keep my shit on track. Okay. And these were questions. I always have notes. These were questions that were submitted on my Instagram story um, by girls. And I'm just going to read off a couple of them before I start into the story. So how did I know that my symptoms were breast implant illness related? That's a really good question. Um, my anxiety hormones and inflammation were off the charts. Now they're normal. Suicidal thoughts were not normal to me. So I knew some, that's when I knew something was wrong. Like I knew something was really, really wrong. Um, all right. I'm going to get right into it. So Where do I, I want to start like really at the beginning when I was like a child because this kind of all, it's all encompassing. I got to tell you the whole story. So like as a child, I don't feel like I ever struggled with self-confidence. I um, was athletically inclined or whatever the word is. If, like I was good at athletics. I was good at sports. So I excelled in soccer. Um yet I was always kind of awkward. Like I was never, I was, ne I don't know how to explain this. I never like came off like I thought I was coming off, if that makes sense. I couldn't really, like I couldn't dance well. I didn't really have like great rhythm. I was just awkward. Like that's the best, and I still am. I feel like that's the best way to describe who I really am is I'm kind of awkward. And <laughs> so, it, socially awkward as well. Let's just put that out there. Like ridiculously socially awkward. And back in the day when I was a kid, no one talked about being introverted. No one talked about being socially awkward. Like we were all just kind of fumbling our way through life. And, I, and I'm not the only one. Like I know so many other people that I went to school with were probably the exact same way. And they, you just don't, you don't want to show it. So you just act like you're fine. You, you know, I would try to act extroverted, which was fucking exhausting. Uh, trying to act like you give a shit about being in a group of people and like enjoy talking to people when you really don't is exhausting. I did that for so long. And, you know, as you grow older, you get, you gain wisdom and you just kind of don't give a fuck about stuff like that anymore. So like, right, like now as an adult, I, I don't care. Like, this is who I am. I'm introverted. I do not like being around people. I do will not be around like a large group of people unless it's a concert. And even then it like gives, sometimes it gives me anxiety. I uh, just won't do those things anymore. I, I just don't care. And especially since COVID, like I will not do things that I don't want to do anymore. And I don't think that sounds like, because I remember like my parents and people used to be like, do things you don't want to do. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you do things that, and I understand that I'm kind of walking a fine line here. Like I understand you have to do things in life you don't want to do. I get that. I preach it all the time. At the end of the day though, like, at this stage in my life and with COVID and everything else, like I have this attitude of like, nothing matters anymore. No, does anything matter? And I'm going to do, this will be a separate episode on COVID. I feel like I'm kind of veering off track a little bit here, but nothing matters anymore, you guys. 
I don't know if you know this. This is not a doom and gloom. This is not being negative. This is real. Nothing matters. COVID has opened up our eyes as a society that no one gives a fucking shit about us. Nothing matters. They're still closing schools down, expecting parents to just like, I don't know, drop their jobs and fucking teach their kids again. And they're not, pay- no one's getting paid to do this. No one's getting paid to take time off work. No one cares about us. <laughs> like, it's just, the, that's just the truth. And other countries don't operate this way. So it, we're shit at this point. And people have realized it. People can see it. Um, we're on our own. We're in the ocean on our own without a life raft. And that has made me be like, I don't give a fuck about anything anymore. If my kid comes home from school and they have an F, I don't care. I know that sounds bad. I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Going beyond the fact of our kids struggling anyway, just as being children. But then now to have the pressure of like, they don't know if people around them are going to die or not. Like, I'm sorry. I feel like that's a little heavy to be put on children. And I can't imagine being my son's age or my daughter's age and having to think about like my grandparents actually dying if they get COVID. Like Kyler asked me that in the car this morning. He's like, because everyone we know right now has COVID. Like they just saw their parents have it. All their teachers now are testing positive. Their kid, their teacher's kids are testing positive. And Kyler was like, are grandma and Appa okay? And I was like, it just like cut me. I was like, oh my God, like he's, like they genuinely have to worry about like their loved ones dying now from a pandemic. And that's a lot of pressure. So when I say I don't give a fuck if they fail a subject, like I I don't care. I don't care. Look at all this pressure they have right now. I don't expect them to perform (laughs) academically. I just don't. Josh is different. He holds a little bit more of like, no, we need to do that. Like he's very like, we got to stay on track. I mean, Maybe he keeps us all together because, I mean, there are days where I would like just be like, fuck it, I don't care about anything. Let's just stay home from school. I've been doing that too. Like, let's just stay home from school today. (laughs) It doesn't matter. (laughs) All right, I'm gonna get back on track, I promise. So let's just get that out there. Like nothing matters. It does, none of this matters. Live your life, enjoy it. I was gonna save this whole like spiel to the end, but like do what you wanna do, do what makes you happy. Don't take things so seriously. For me to sit here and be saying, don't take things so seriously is like, the conundrum or like the fucking like hell is freezing over like I am I worry about everything <laughs> I wor- I'm a huge, and I still do I still worry about everything but like I just don't give a fuck as much anymore if that makes sense all right getting back on track I promise rest and play illness we're gonna start so back where I was saying like I I'm awkward I struggled with being introverted not being I, I didn't have a ton of friends because I didn't like being around people I always felt uncomfortable um but I excelled in sports. That was my thing. And as I got older, I never ever really struggled with my body, ever. Like I never, I was always thin. Genetically, I take after my dad and my dad's side of the family, they're all thin. Um, and so I never had to worry about what I ate. And from a very young age, I had, like I loved food. I, I just was, Food hits me differently than it does most people. And I know that I'm not the only one, but I I love food. I don't ever stop thinking about food. I plan my meals days in advance. I think I already know today what I'm having for lunch, what I'm having for dinner. I already know, like, I'm one of those people that if someone's like, hey, let's go have dinner, you know, tomorrow or the next day, I will scope the menu where we're going. I will know what I'm ordering before I get there, before I sit down. So with that being said, I never struggled with gaining weight until I was in my mid 20s and I was on antidepressants. That was when I started noticing my anxiety, which is why I got on antidepressants. Um, But the antidepressants never worked. They always made me feel like a zombie, like I didn't care about anything. And I knew when it wasn't right was when I, you know, I had my pug, Molly, that was my first, she was like my first child, I will say. And I'll never forget when I got on the antidepressant, like I, she, I would like take her everywhere with me. Again, she was legitimately like a child to me, never, ever out of my sight. And when I got on the antidepressants, I remember one day being like, 
if she ran out in the middle of the street and got hit by a car, like we were out in the front yard or something and she was in the yard. And I remember normally I would be like a psychopath, like don't go in the street. Oh my God, don't go near the street. I'll have a heart attack if you get off the curb. And I remember like vividly thinking like, if she went out in the middle of the street and got hit by a car, like it would just be what it is. Like, and I remember at that point I was like, something is seriously fucking wrong with me. Why did I just think that? No, like it, like if it happened, I had no emotion. It was so weird. So I called my doctor and I was like, I need to get off of this. Like I, I don't, I have no feeling at all. <laughs> and I don't, I'd rather feel crazy at this point and like try to Uber manage everything than like be a walking zombie. And so she told me to get off of it. I was on Prozac. Didn't work, obviously. And since then, I had tried, you know, my doctors tried to put me on other types of antidepressants. I tried Lexapro. I tried, um, what's the other one? Fuck, what's it called? I can't remember. I tried Lexapro and one other one. And it, it had the same reaction every time. Like, one of them made me hallucinate. Like, it just, I don't, my body does not tolerate antidepressants. And it took me years to figure out it's because I wasn't depressed. I was like borderline bipolar and cyclothymia is what I have diagnosed myself with. And I'm pretty like my doctor has agreed that that prognosis is pretty fucking accurate. Um, if you don't know what that is, like look it up. I had never heard of it. One of my closest friends is a licensed therapist and she is the one who told me that term and she knows me inside and out. So she was like, you know, I'm not going to diagnose you because I'm not, you know, clinically, I'm not technically your therapist, but she's like, girl, this is what you have. And so I looked it up and I was like, that that's me. <laughs> that is me. That's me to a T. Because I never was, bo I was never actually bipolar. Like one or two, they classify bipolar one or bipolar two. I wasn't either of those because I didn't have the mania with either of them. Like I wasn't going on shopping sprees and like having like all these crazy all or nothing type of scenarios, like ups and downs. I wasn't like that. I was just up and down like on a middle spectrum. So anyway. And I'm now on a mood stabilizer, which has helped tremendously. So just throwing that out there, if you're someone who struggles with any of the things that I'm talking about and you don't really know where to start, I have a lot of friends who are on antidepressants and they're like, I don't know that it's working. I'm like, ask your doctor about a mood stabilizer. It has been a game changer for me. Now, I'm not saying it will for you, but I'm just detailing what works for me. Um, I feel like I'm getting way off track today. Maybe I'm not. I always feel like this when I'm filming and then like it somehow comes together. So when I was on the antidepressants, that's what made me put on weight in my mid twenties. And I didn't know, I, I don't think anyone really told me that like that it can cause weight gain, but I put on some weight. And at this time I was also lying on the couch every day and eating Taco Bell every day. I remember it like it was yesterday. These are my glory days. I talk about this because I can remember vividly waking up. I didn't have a job. I was unemployed at the time for God knows what reason. My mid twenties, I didn't have a job. Josh was working. I woke up every day at 10 o'clock on the dot because that's when Taco Bell opened. And I threw on my sweatpants and I drove to Taco Bell up the street and ordered two nachos bel grande. I don't even think they have these anymore. That was what they had. No, sorry, go back. Mucho grande nachos. They don't have those on the menu anymore. They have the Nacho Bel Grande, which is like a small one. But the mu at the time, they had a Mucho Grande nachos, if you guys remember. And it was huge. It was like two or three Nacho Bel Grandes on one massive plate. It was fucking orgasmic. And so I would go through and I, I would say, have like a Mucho Grande nacho, no beef, no beans, extra sour cream, extra cheese, extra tomatoes, and extra jalapenos with a Dr. Pepper. That was my order every fucking day for a year and a half. No lie. I ate this every single day. I would get it. I would drive home. I would sit down on my couch, turn on a movie and eat. And it was bliss. It was like, and I remember like, this was right after I moved out of my parents' house. Not Maybe not right after, but it, I mean, not long. Like we were living in our own house and I was 22, 23. So like, I remember being like, I've got the world at my hands. I'm gonna eat Taco Bell every day. <laughs> like, what the fuck? These were my goals and aspirations were to just exist and inhale Taco Bell every day at 1030 in the morning while watching movies. It was, it like fed my soul on another level. I can't even, <laughs> and I'm never going to look back on that and be like, 
Why did I do that? Like, I, I enjoyed the fuck out of it. I loved it. <laughs> However, after time, I was gaining a lot of weight. And I did. I was in denial because I'd been thin my whole life, never struggled with eating anything and gaining weight ever. And so once I started, like, my clothes weren't fitting, I remember specifically going to the mall to express with my mom. And I remember trying on, cause my clothes weren't fitting. So I was like, I need some new jeans. And I remember in my head, like I had already begun to justify it. Like oh, I'm just getting older. And my mom, I had like a size seven, I think, or a nine. And I was normally a size two. So trying on a size, whatever, six or eight, I guess, not seven or nine. And I was like, why aren't these fitting? And I'll never forget. I was like, mom, I think I need like a 13. And so she brought me like a size 13 jean and they fit. And I was like, what? Like, how am I like a size 13 all of a sudden? I swear to you, this is my, bro like I was not aware. It was very weird. I talk about this all the time. I was in denial up until I saw a photo of myself. My sister took a picture of me laying down on the ground in my parents' backyard with her pugs, Daisy and Myrtle. And I'm like, I have a bandana on. So I, during this time, wore a bandana and gaucho pants every day. That's what I lived in was a white bandana, gaucho pants, and a big baggy t-shirt because that's all that fit me. And when I saw the photo, I was like, I don't look like that. It, it legit does not look like me. It does not look like me at all. And that was my moment of, and I said to Josh and my sister, I was like, do I look like that? And they were like, yes. Like what? I don't understand what's your question. And it, I just, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So that moment was when I was like, oh my God, I need to get this weight off. That is not me. So I started running and doing cardio and that's it. Like I was running in like 95 degree heat every day. Like just, I remember that desperation of like, if I can run when it's really hot, I'll lose all this weight and I'll go home and I'll eat lettuce and tuna. That's what I would eat. I would eat like tuna on lettuce with lemon juice and salt, like no carbs. Like that's all I would eat some days. I mean, you're talking maybe 250 calories and I would get super dizzy. There was times I almost passed out at the gym or on the track. Uh, just not knowing what to do and this you know obviously i've talked about this in other episodes about you know women's health and fitness and stuff like this like we are brainwashed as a society and when i was younger that's all any of us me and my friends like we just if we wanted to lose weight we went and ran and didn't eat like that's what we did and weight came off i was young enough to where like i started running every day and the weight came off but i didn't want to change i still loved food so like once the weight came off i just went right back to eating what i was eating which was crap i mean I never ate healthy. And when I, let's see, this went up and down from here on out. Like when I started that cycle, I would basically eat like crap, gain a bunch of weight, drop it in a really restrictive, not healthy way, gain it all back. You know what I mean? Like I, it was very yo-yo from that point on up until, gosh, up until I got pregnant with Kyler. And that, I was 26 when I got pregnant. And um, it was like 2008. I had him in 2009 and I gained 60 pounds, 50 or 60 pounds with him. I took it as a free for all when I got pregnant. I was like, this is, it, it, this is, I kind of was like, this is an excuse. Like I'm pregnant, I'm gonna have fun. I'm gonna enjoy it. And I did. I, <laughs> boy, did I enjoy my pregnancy. I had never really liked ice cream up until that point And that's all I wanted. I, I never ate ice cream or cookies because I've always been a savory type person as opposed to sweets. I never really ate sweets. I just didn't have taste for sweets prior to getting pregnant with Kyler. I blame all this on Kyler. When I got pregnant with him, I ate marble slab every fucking night. I would drive to marble slab every night and get like a massive cup of ice cream. I, I, that like that, a light switch went off in my brain and I suddenly wanted sugar all the time. 
Uh, so after I had Kyler, I had a lot of weight to lose. And I mean, I remember my shoes not fitting. I was so uncomfortable in my skin. My friends were fucking skinny and cute. And I remember that first feeling of like, this is not me anymore. Like I was always the skinny, cute girl. And now I'm not. And now my friends are. And I feel like gross. And none of my clothes fit. I mean, there was like, I didn't even allow. I don't think I've ever said it this. I like wouldn't even allow some of my friends to come over to my house and see my baby. That's how insecure I was. Like, I would not let them come over. And th this was not about me. Like, I made it about me. They want to come over and see my baby. And I was like, no, I'm sorry. I don't, you know, I just wasn't comfortable. I didn't want anyone to see me. So I hold up in my house for like eight weeks. No lie. We did not leave the house for eight weeks. Um, again, I didn't know how to get the weight off. I, I, I didn't know. So fast forward a couple of years. I got the weight off. I started doing cleanses and stuff like that. I ended up getting kind of okay like with some like I got down to where I felt okay but I still wasn't like I still didn't love my body this is kind of when like that the hatred of my body began then when I got pregnant with Bryn I was like I'm making a concerted effort to do better this time like I don't want to just eat just to eat like I, I've been there done that I don't want to do it again luckily with Bryn I crave I just remember craving like fruits and kiwi and like I didn't eat meat with either pregnancy, but like I craved legitimately like healthy foods, like vegetables when I was pregnant with Bryn. I had never eaten vegetables before. So I remember I, I did kind of get lucky that my cravings were healthy things. So I only gained like, I think like 30, 35 pounds with her. Um, I felt cute when I was pregnant with Bryn. I was much smaller. Um, and then I didn't have a ton of weight to lose after I had her. After I had Brynn, this is where everything kind of builds up and I'm getting into the story. I promise this is about breast implant illness. <laughs> I'm just trying to relate it. This is just a life story episode from me. Jesus. So after I had Brynn, I had postpartum depression. I did not know at the time that this was postpartum depression. I didn't know till years later. So I'm setting the stage. I started drinking. I was at home with two kids going fucking nuts. When I was at home, after Bryn was born with two kids under the, well, Kyler was four and Bryn was a baby. I, I, I was like, this life, this is, life is not for me. I don't want to stay at home with kids. I don't like it. I'm not a crafty mom. I'm sure as fuck not a play date mom. Play dates made me want to rip my eyeballs out, throw them on the ground and stomp on them and then smash my face into a wall. Like, I hated having to do play dates to give my kids something to do because then I had to talk to people. I hated it. That was a, like, I'm not kidding you. I would have massive anxiety waking up every day because I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do with my kids today? What am I going to do with these, these people? <laughs> I was like, that's how I, like, I don't know. And I know that like, maybe I'm not a regular mom, <laughs> but that is how I felt. And it was very overwhelming. I felt like I was serving no purpose. I felt like all I did was wake up and clock in as a janitor, except I didn't get a paycheck. I just literally was like a janitor that worked for free. So then I would clean all day long and my husband would come home at six o'clock and be like, oh my God, why is the house a mess? And I'm like, I, I literally been cleaning all day. Like I, wait, I can understand if I laid on the couch. Like I've been cleaning all day. It's a mess because I have these two kids here that like follow me around and I'll fold laundry and then they pull it out of the basket and it's on the floor. So like, why am I even folding the laundry? So I started drinking to cope. That's the only way I knew, you know, I, I, I skipped over the big part of my childhood. I drank in high school and got in a lot of trouble. I got expelled from school. I've always had issues with alcohol as well as food, but I kind of dove back down. I dove back down that rabbit hole of drinking at this point. Cause I was like, I don't know what, what am I going to do? I don't even know what else to do with my life right now. I'll just drink and mask everything which made it a gazillion times worse. So having postpartum depression, not knowing it, and then drinking on top of that, like it was a recipe for disaster. However, this recipe for disaster was literally the catalyst that changed my life and brought me to where I'm sitting here right now. So that's what I have to lead, have to lead into this story and tell you the backstory. This might be an hour and a half episode. And I, I just remember, oh, I'm gonna mark this. At this point, there I was in like an existential crisis period of like, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Like that's how much I was spiraling. 
The thoughts I were having were scaring me. I didn't know why I was having those thoughts. Then I felt guilt for having those thoughts. And then when the guilt set in, you're like, oh my God, why am I, why am I complaining about my life? I have nothing to complain about. My kids are healthy. I have a husband who supports me to stay at home, even though I'm going crazy staying at home. I don't have to work. He works. You know what I mean? And then you have all this like, so it's it was literally like a cycle of like, this sucks. It's hard as fuck. I don't want to do it. Damn, now I feel guilty because I'm comparing my life to other people who have actual problems and I don't have problems. But, but it it's, this is why I never want to minimize when someone goes to compare and be like, well, because God, it is important to stop yourself and be grateful for what you have. I will always, always, I had to do this to myself the other day. I was complaining about not being able to work out last week because I had COVID. And then I was like, who am I to sit here and complain about not being able to work out because I had COVID for one week? People are dying. So that, I had to pull myself back in. Like, shut the fuck up. Like, be grateful. Be quiet. Like, it doesn't, you not being able to work out is not the biggest deal. Shut up. Literally had that moment with myself. So it is important to pull yourself back sometimes and remind yourself of all the things you have to be grateful for because it I truly believe that it does mentally put you in a better space just to live and mindfulness all that stuff however when you're really struggling mentally I don't there are times where I don't think that it is good to try to always be positive patty and always try to spin it with a grateful attitude. It just, it, that doesn't work. And that can make you even worse. That can make you even crazier, which is what happened with me. I was overanalyzing every thought I was having. And at the end of the day, like I was still very unhappy with my body, very unhappy, but I wasn't, wasn't doing anything to change it. I was waking up and eating like shit every day. And this point I'm like pounding a bottle of wine at noon every day. So like God knows how many calories I'm just drinking. And it was a cycle. It was a sick, sick cycle. And it got so bad to where my husband and my sister stepped in and gave me basically like, it was almost like an intervention. They were like, something has to change. And at the time, one of my friends was going through a program. She had gained weight during her pregnancy and she signed up with this trainer and got the weight off. And she was looking fabulous. And, you know, it just, I remember being very inspired by her. And so I was like, I, I think I'm going to hire your trainer. And everyone was like, this is not going to go well. Like you have been able to diet for like 14 days max and then you like give up and go back. So, which is all I had ever done. Rightfully so. They were right to like question if I was able to even stick with it. However, this was going to be the first time I hired a coach, financially put the money out, like put the money where my mouth is and it was expensive. So I knew that if I committed financially, that was going to be like, the ticket like that is what and we say this all the time now that I'm a coach like I when you financially commit to something you treat it differently you take it more seriously you show up you get it done because you don't want to waste that money that you're spending so that was a huge part of it was I forked over the money and I was like okay I'm going to do this I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it right for the first time in my life I don't want to give up and this was in 2013 I'll never forget this timeline I mean eight years ago now and it was no joke. My trainer was no joke. She was no bullshit. I did not get cheat meals. Like it was very restrictive. Um, it worked. It, 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 I'm so grateful. I will forever be grateful for that experience. I wouldn't be sitting here right now having a podcast or my own business if it was not for that experience that I went through. So I always want to be very like upfront about how grateful I am for that experience for my coach, my very first coach. Was it the healthiest way to go about losing weight and getting in shape? Probably not, but it, it did the job. And I'll never forget that those first three months were so hard, but I'll, I had so much energy and I started to feel unlike I had ever felt in my life because of how restrictive I was being. I went from eating junk food my whole life, never ever even caring to eat anything with any nutritional value whatsoever. I just didn't care. And I never had to worry about it. So why? It was always thin. Why would I ever worry about eating a vegetable? I don't, I can eat Doritos and stay a size two. Who cares? If I can eat Doritos and stay a size two, you bet your fucking ass I'm not going to opt for broccoli when I can just pound a family size bag of Doritos. So that, uh, <laughs> that was my attitude. However, when I started this transformation, I was eating, I drastically changed everything I ate. No sugar, none. Everything I had was sugar-free. No gluten, 
no dairy and no alcohol. I like to call those like like the four what well, I don't even know. Dairy, sugar, alcohol and gluten. I mean they just all cause a lot of inflammation essentially and make you feel like shit. So when I took all those out of my diet, I remember feeling so ridiculously energetic and happy. Like that was how I felt and it took a long time because I still had that like, you know, this was years. This what I was trying to do was undo years of like just the way I had lived, really. I, and, and yes, I felt good and had energy, but I still was like, oh my God, I would give anything just to like eat. Like it made the cravings worse. And like I said, I didn't get cheat meals, but once every like eight weeks. I mean, you guys, <laughs> once every eight weeks. And when I had a cheat meal, I'll never forget my first one ever. I'll never forget. I planned it out so methodically. I made homemade French fries out of like, I went and bought potatoes and like fucking made homemade french fries i got a bunch of ranch dressing from mazio's i went and got sushi from i don't even remember the place that's closed down now there's a sushi place up the street from us i went and got a bunch of sushi i got bunk cakes from nothing bunk cake nothing bunk cakes i got um hang on i want to see if i can find the photo and put it up here this is why i have notes because i make if i want to add pictures I, I do have a picture somewhere of my first cheat meal. Let's see if I can put it up here. Anyway, it was orgasmic. I, I ate so much. And the, the thing with my trainer was like, if you have a cheat meal, like it is not like a meal. Like you have one hour. You have to set, you, I forgot about this. We have to set a timer for one hour. And that was all we had. You could eat whatever you wanted in that one hour. So I, I remember like setting a timer and like eating everything. I, I passed out on the couch because my body was like heating up. I was so, my body, like all the influx of sugar and alcohol, dare, all that stuff because I had a cocktail too. I passed out on the couch. My body literally like shut down <laughs> from all that shit. It was so good. Anyway, I digress. I'm trying to stay on track. Again, I promise this episode is about breast implant illness. So I stuck with it. I did three months and then I signed back up for six. Then I did a year. Then I did a year and a half. By this time, I was like, I felt like my body was rocking. I felt good for the first time in my life about myself. And everything I had ever struggled with previously about and being introverted, awkward, uh, anxious, having little mild depressive episodes, all that went away. It all went away. I, I remember being like, I don't, I've never felt like this in my life. I feel like I'm able to be the best version of myself I've ever been and I never thought that would happen. And it was through discipline. It was through changing the way I ate. It was through working out. Working out was my, it, working out is medicine to me. Working out is medicine for people with anxiety. If you, you will notice a trend. If you're in the gym long enough, you'll start noticing that everyone in the gym, most everyone in the gym is just like you. They struggle with insecurities, body insecurities. They struggle with anxiety. And working out is medicine to those people. And working out and getting regular exercise changed my life. It changed the way I felt. I began getting questions all the time from women. How are you? Because all these women who had been following me or we had been friends on social media knew how much I loved food and how much I struggled with diets. Like I never stuck with it. I was the girl that like never stuck with diets. I was like, like I was the one that like, if they invited me out, I was the one that persuaded everyone to go get cheese fries at one in the morning. So for people to see me actually making physical progress and like feeling good about myself and looking good and sticking with something they all thought I was doing something crazy like a magic pill like what are you doing and I will say you know I had I, I, I never wanted to sugarcoat anything I never wanted to be like I never wanted to make it come off like it wasn't as hard as it actually was because it was very hard I don't ever want to discount how hard it was there were so many days where I remember one day in particular I was at my office working when I was working for my husband at the time and everyone had left the office. So it was just me by myself. And this rep came in and brought 12 hot chocolate glazed donuts, piping hot. And now if you don't know, like chocolate glazed, chocolate long john, those are like my favorite. He brings them in and sets them on the desk. And I'm like, is this is a test of some sort. Like, I mean, I had like a, a moment of like, I, no one's here. I could eat like six of these and no one would know. And I wanted them so bad. I wanted them so bad. I'll never forget that day. I think I have a picture. 
Hopefully I can find all these. I'll never forget it. And I was like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And I didn't. I'll never forget how I felt making it through it. Cause like once you get past that, like you don't fucking need it, don't do it, it's not worth it. And then you like 20 minutes passes, you're so happy you didn't do it. And so I just did that over and over and over and over. And I was so proud of myself that day. That was like the ultimate test. Like to have someone buy me hot chocolate glazed donuts and no one else was around, I could have, I legitimately could have eaten six and been like, but I would have felt like shit. Anyway, um, so I started telling women the truth. I was like, I'm working my ass off. I work out twice a day. Well, not twice a day. I was only able to go once. So I did two hours because most people on the program, if they could go twice a day, they would do cardio first and then go weight train. I combined it because I only, I had two kids. So I had a membership at Sky and I would take them to the kid care. I, you had two hours that you could leave your kids in the kid care. So I maximized on that. And I was like, all right, two, like two hours. I'll be back in 120 minutes. Don't fucking bother me during my workout. And I would do two hours of a workout seven days a week. Not six, not five, not four. Seven days a week, I was in the gym for two hours every day, eating about a thousand calories a day. So like I said, I got in great shape, started um, bulking after my year because I was so thin at that point that I needed to put, I was like, okay, I want to get muscular now. I want to look like good. I want to be like toned. This was like my like, okay, I really want to get the body I've never had, but had always wanted. And I did. I got it. I had never felt so good about myself in my life. Because I was always thin, but I was always like, I don't want to, I don't ever use the F word, but when I like skinny fat, I'll say skinny fat because I'm referring to myself. I don't ever use that word, by the way. I don't allow my clients to use it. It is like a, it's the hush, hush, no, no word. You don't fucking utter it. I'll say it about myself because I was, I was always thin, but I was always skinny fat. So like I always had cellulite. I never was like. Like I envy girls who just don't have cellulite and like even when they gain weight, they look good. You know what I mean? Like if I get, like when I put on weight, I don't even look like myself. Like I don't, it, I don't hold weight well at all. Even like seven pounds. I get very puffy looking. And I had always wanted to be like toned with like an ass and like nice quads. And you know, I've been working on my legs for eight years and they're still not where I want them. Like my legs are my Achilles heel. Like. I work out legs hard and I still don't have them where I want them. Like, and I nitpick, I get it, but I did get my body to a place where I never thought I would achieve physically a goal. And I felt so good. So now I've got like this confidence that is just soaring. I'm help, I'm starting to actually help other women. I'm telling them what I'm doing. At this point, I was like, how do I turn this into a business? I love this. I would wake up like and eat, sleep and breathe this shit. Just it, just telling my story really is how it began. I just was telling my story to other women because they were asking me in my DMs every day, like, what are you doing? I want to do the diet you're doing. And I was just honest with them. And I was like, I'm working really hard and motivating them at the same time. I started doing Facebook Lives. That's how this all kind of began. And I felt on top of the world. Nothing could stop me. Nothing. And I turned a point I competed in a show I talked about that and like a couple ep episode back that was the last episode actually so I already detailed all that that fucked with me mentally I did a lot of things that were not good for me at that point I, I kind of got to that point where I, like it was you just want to keep putting your hand in the cookie jar like I my body was great but I wanted more so I did steroids multiple steroids got huge was in complete denial of how big I was just wanted to get bigger and bigger and bigger and at that point, I got injured. This was in 2018. Because 2017, in December, I started community with Caroline. This was right after I competed. I was starting to spiral mentally of like, I don't want to lose this physique. I was going through a very hard, very hard mental period. Um, and, and again, this is hormonal stuff that like, when I talked about the postpartum depression, this is stuff that just happens that you you kind of don't have control over. So like, when you compete, no one talks about how much it jacks with your hormone levels. Well, your hormone levels literally regulate everything in your entire body. So if your hormones are off, like everything else is going to kind of fall away and you have to kind of fix that first. Well, my hormones were kind of out of whack after my show. I had the post-show blues, as they say, and I was terrified to lose my, fit, my physique. So I was, I knew I was kind of at a precipice. Like, what do I do? <laughs> how do I keep living 
I want to live. Like, I want to eat the foods I want. Am I ever? I remember just having that like crisis of like, am I ever going to be able to eat what I fucking really enjoy ever? I really don't want to continue eating chicken and rice five times a day for the rest of my life. Like, I know I won't. When I'm 80, I'm not going to be eating chicken and rice. Like, so how, what do I do now? Like, I still did not have. I still did not have any sense of knowing what to do. I had just had a coach telling me what to do. And I had gone from one end of the spectrum to the fucking other. So I started Community with Caroline December 2017. I just started helping women. I went part time at my job because I, you know, I was charging, I think it was like 50 bucks for a meal plan. And we were doing like cha- like 30 day challenges at, at the beginning. And I'll never forget that first month. I was like so scared I wouldn't have anyone sign up because I just created this group. I created a group on Facebook and invited a bunch of my friends. And I think we had 30 members the first month and I had 20 signups the first month. And I thought I was like, Jesus. I was like, oh my God, 20 signups. Like I'm the shit. And it literally grew from there. I I hate to be so cliche, but it did. Like from day one, when I started Community with Caroline, it went from here and it's been going, well, COVID has given us a little bit of a bumpy ride, but let's be real, everyone and on planet earth has had a bumpy ride since COVID. But like, since I started it, it's grown. And now I have like a, a biz, an actual business. And I've been able to quit my job. I quit my job working for my husband. That was my goal. I didn't want to work as an office manager at a lawn company that wasn't fulfilling to me. And I wanted to do what I love to do and get paid for it. So that's what happened. 2018, when I did the steroids, I got hurt and it was a neck and it was a really bad neck injury. And after, you know, that was a really stressful time. I never really started, I never struggled mentally from the moment I began my transformation until that period because I was unable to work out like at all. I remember specifically not being able to move. I remember I have a picture. I'm sitting in the chair with an ice pack. I could not move my neck. I got up and went to the gym and tried to walk on the treadmill that day. And my husband was like, you're a fucking idiot. Like, what are you doing? Why are you going? You can't even move your neck. Do you know how dangerous this is? Like, you're really going to go try to work out. And I just remember that feeling of like, I'm not having this taken away from me. I won't. I, I will not allow working out being to take away from me, being taken away from me. And I'll never forget when I was on the treadmill, no one was there at the gym. I was on an incline and I was in so much pain. I was like crying. And I was like, I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let something like this take this away from me. I won't do it. And I, at that point realized that working out was like that. I mean, I said it before, like working out was my medicine. I had to have it. I worked out every day for four years. I worked out every day, every day. Yes, it tapered from seven to like six or five, but I worked out every day. It was, that's part, that was part of my day, part of my routine. It was like my fucking pill that I took every day. And if I missed it, I didn't miss it. I didn't miss a day. And I remember one day, one of my friends was like, what would you do if like you couldn't work out again? And I was like, "Mm mm-mm. Mm -mm. I don't even want to think about that. So after I got off the steroids, I noticed symptoms beginning. This is where I'm getting into the breast implant illness. When I started experiencing symptoms, when I was on the steroids, I was having trouble peeing. I wasn't drinking enough water. I noticed throat clearing, excess saliva. Those were kind of the first symptoms. And my ear got really muffled, my left ear. And I... just started noticing weird things one at a time it wasn't nothing hit me all at once it was very small things that were disruptive enough to my day-to-day life that i but i didn't know nothing i wasn't like pinpointing all this is related to this it was like how is my ear being muffled related to my throat and how is my throat related to my bladder you know what i mean like it was just these weird things i got off the steroids and um from that day forward, the symptoms got worse and they started to compound compound, and multiply and random like joint pain. The joint pain, it's interesting now when I'm talking about this and relaying the story over again, I forget about these. And people have, women have told me this when I explanted and I was like, when will I ever have my life back? They were like, you'll, you'll look back on this one day and you'll forget all these symptoms. And I was like, there's no way because I lived with him for so long. So in 2018, is when my decline started happening drastically. I I don't want to forget my symptoms. Anxiety began. Hair loss was a slow process, but I started kind of noticing my hair was thin. Like my hair was always really fucking thick and it started thinning. I 
uh, bladder issues. I had overactive bladder, so I couldn't really empty my bladder ever. Um, throat pain, excessive swallowing, and then the joint pain began. And the joint pain was really weird. Like my knees just started hurting, like bad. So bad that I couldn't like do a lunge like at the gym. And I was like, this is really weird. Like, did I, hurt? I mean, I remember like I almost went to like an orthopedic doctor to like look at my knee. I remember this, but I didn't want to spend the money. And slowly but surely, like I was getting injured more, which was also probably a sign. I'm just now thinking this, like I was getting injured a lot. Like my body was literally just starting to like crumble. It's what it felt like. I was in the meantime, I was taking progress pictures because at this time, like the thing that really started bugging me out is I was noticing that as I was going to the gym and doing something that normally fed me up to the brim, filled me up, made me feel on top of the world, gave me energy, I would leave the gym feeling like $1,000 was all of a sudden making me feel really, really sluggish and tired. Like I couldn't lift as much without it hurting, just hurting, hurting so bad. And I couldn't push myself through workouts. It was like I would go and there were days where I was just like, I can't do this. Like I winded, couldn't walk on the treadmill. Just very, very bizarre. I was having to take days off work just to rest. Um, something wasn't adding up and I couldn't figure it out. I kept thinking just, I don't even know what I excused it away as for a while, but I kept trying to go every day. I'd show up to the gym and just try and nothing was working. As I was taking progress pictures for my coaches who were different coaches at the time, my body and I, my body started going completely flat. Like I was thick. I had a bubbled up ass. My legs looked great prior to all these symptoms starting. I went within a year, I went from like having a very toned physique and a thicker, larger physique. I was a waif. My butt literally disappeared. It disappeared. It was gone. I'm going to, Hang on, I want to make sure I put a picture up. I lost my ass and I couldn't, I, I couldn't understand. I was like, what's happening to my body? Even my coaches at the time. So we were trying a bunch of different things. And he was like, let's up you and see what happens. So I would up to like 2,700 calories. Nothing changed. Nothing about my body changed. It just, it was literally like, here's your body and it's, this is where you're at. You're not going up. You're not going down. You're not, it doesn't matter what you do. You're staying right here right now. So if I dropped them to 1600, nothing happened. If I upped them to 2700, nothing changed with my body. Even, I was even working, I was trying to work out. It's like, I, I went completely flat. And as I was taking fit pictures, I was asking my husband, like, what is going on? Why is my body looking like this? And he was like, I don't know. It was just so weird. And, I felt like something was getting stripped away from me day by day because I wasn't, like I said, it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. My symptoms, when they started, it just, it was like, here we go. Like you're on the roller coaster now and you're going down. Like, so from 2018 to 2019, it got really bad. I got to a point where I thought I was dying. I'm not being dramatic. I told my husband multiple times, what if I'm actually dying? What if my body is just shutting down? I'm dying. Like I'm going to die at a young age. Like what if I'm dying? And dead serious question. He thought I was being, he's like, Caroline, you're not dying. But when you can't get out of bed in the morning without literally your knees buckling and you feeling like you're, you, you feel like you're in a 90 year old woman's body, something ain't right. That's when I start like, when the workouts went from like, I'm trying, but I can't do it to nothing. Like I can't even walk into the gym. So I knew something was not right, but I still had no clue what breast implant illness was. I didn't know. I'd never heard of, I, I had heard of it. I didn't want to look at it. I remember knowing about it, but I was like, don't go down that rabbit hole. And I, I purposely didn't like research it for a long time, but I didn't, I didn't know. I just heard breast implant illness, like your breast implants could make you sick or whatever. I didn't, not a lot of people were talking about it. So I knew none, I didn't know what like symptoms of it were. So I just remember slowly having the gym ripped away from me, sent me into so much anxiety and depression that I hadn't felt in so long that I wanted to die. Like, and I'm not being serious. Like I didn't really want to die. You know what I mean? But like, I felt like I had nothing. Well, by this time, like I have a business, 
I've made a business out of motivating women. I've made a business out of, in my opinion, looking a certain way. I've made a business about being a leader and feeling really good about myself and then being able to pass on that motivation and inspiration to others. Now I'm done. What am I now? I'm a fucking shell of what I was. I don't, I don't like this person. Now I feel like I'm back to like something I had hated about myself for so long. Who am I even? I don't even want to do any of this anymore. I felt like I, I felt like who I was had been taken away from me and I had no say in it. And I remember for so long feeling like it was so goddamn unfair. I just, I remember feeling this is so unfair. Like, and I would look at other people and be like, why doesn't she struggle? Like, why doesn't she, she has implants? Like, and not never ever in my life wishing this upon anyone, but just being like, why me? Like, why am I struggling? Why? Why, why, why did I work so hard for so long to get to where I felt really good about myself to just have it stripped away and I can't do a thing about it? That was the most unnerving thing. I had no control, none. For the first time in my life, I couldn't control the situation and I I was losing it. I was losing it on the inside. I was not upfront about this publicly, but I was dying on the inside because now my business, in my opinion, my business was at stake. How am I supposed to motivate people looking like this? How am, I, how, am I supposed to, how am I supposed to pass on inspiration when I don't even want to do any of this anymore? I can't. I physically can't go to the gym. Now what do I talk about in the group? What do, what do I talk about to these women? So I, I had to continue doing check-ins every week and motivating women and pushing them, you know, go to the gym, get your workouts in. When I could not, I physically wasn't able to do any of those things. And like I said, this sent me into a very, 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 very dark place. A, the darkest place I've ever been in my life. And then the, the really scary part started happening, which was suicidal thoughts, not knowing why I was having suicidal thoughts. So when I say like, I was talking about the brain fog earlier. Brain fog with breast implant illness is like its own beast. I would take my kids to school every day and they used to argue about who got dropped off first. And they would, they always wanted to be the one that got dropped off last. So I just was at one point I was like, okay, I'll drop Kyler off today first and we'll swap every day. Well, I, the brain fog was so bad that I couldn't remember day to day who I had dropped off the previous day first. And it just became a thing. Kyler, I would rely on Kyler to remind me. And he would be like, mom, how do you not remember? You dropped me off first yesterday. I'm like, I don't remember. I couldn't remember people's names. I got to a point where I literally could not, like our animals, our, our farm animals. There was one point where Josh was talking about one of our donkeys. And I, like, this was a donkey we had had for a year. And I remember he said his name. He said, Henry, I'm bringing Henry up or something. And I was like, who's Henry? And he was like, our donkey? And I was like, and it took me like 20 seconds. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got it. Sorry. And it was a lot. It was a lot of moments like that. A lot of moments where I would literally forget people's names. That people that I knew. That's how bad the brain fog was. So the brain fog, I, I, I knew that like mentally I wasn't there, but I couldn't pinpoint it, pinpoint why. But when the suicidal thoughts happened, it wasn't like a real suicidal thought. Like it wasn't like something I had would ever act on, especially now that I'm a mom. I would never do that ever. But knowing that I would never do that, but the thoughts were still going on made me even crazier, I think. Because I was like, why are these thoughts in my head? Why? Why are these thoughts in my, why are they existing in my brain? I know I wouldn't do this, but why are they telling me to do it? Who's, who's in my brain? It was almost like someone was in my brain telling me to do things. And I was like, no, 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 stop. I couldn't shut it off. I could not shut the thoughts off. No matter what I did, I tried meditating. I tried journaling. I tried therapy. I was in therapy for two years. I, nothing could shut these thoughts off. I remember, I'll never forget, first therapy session ever. I walked in, I sat down. She said, why are you here? I said, I, I need I'm very, I keep hitting myself. I'm getting, I'm getting very animated. I was like, I need this to stop. I'm so anxious and I can't stop it. For the first time in my life, I don't have control over my thoughts. So up until that moment, I had always been able to kind of talk myself off a ledge. I, you know, I've had panic attacks in the past. I always was able to talk myself out of them. 
This was the first time in my life where it got really scary to where I, I legitimately did not have control over the thoughts that were going through my head. And when they're suicidal thoughts, that is, I think, I mean, like the worst of the worst, like I, the most terrifying thought you could ever have. Um, Cause then it would be like, I didn't trust myself. So then I was like, oh my God, what, what if I do? Like what, it was, I can't explain it. Again, I, I'm having a really hard time articulating this, but like, it was like, I knew I wouldn't do it, but what, what if I did? What if I, what if, what if this is getting so bad that I don't have control over what I do? It was on another level. This was when it, I started asking my husband, like, what if I'm dying? What if this is all just like a slow decline in my health and I'm dying? And again, bless his heart. He didn't know. He knew nothing. He didn't even know what breast implants was. He, I, at this time I still didn't know. And so he would just be like, you know, he, for my workouts, he'd be like, go Caroline, drink some caffeine, get a pre-workout. Everyone's tired go to the gym and just do it. And I'd be like, no, 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 you don't get it. I can't. And he'd be like, well, stop saying you can't. This is what you wouldn't tell your clients. You wouldn't tell your clients you can't. You'd make them go. And I'm like, but you're not understanding. Like, So the hardest part about breast implant illness for me was feeling so alone. No one knew what I was going through. No one. And if I tried to explain it, no one understood. And if they tried to understand, it sounded so batshit crazy that they were like, I don't know how to help you. And when you're talking to doctors about this, like, and, and begging medical professionals to help you because that's what they went to school for for eight years or however long, and they can't help you, but they want to help you. Like, that was when I was like, I'm in a dead end street. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> I, I, there were days where I was like, I guess I just live like this. I guess this is just my life. This sucks. Like, doctors don't know what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me? They're not even trying to tell me it's autoimmune. They just don't know. Well, your ear can't be related to your throat, and your throat can be related to your bladder, and I don't know why you're anxious. Get on some medication. Well, you're aging. Oh, your joints hurt? Well, yeah, take some omega-3. Like, no, you're not understanding. There, the symptoms got so bad that it was literally debilitating to my life. I couldn't live. I wasn't living. I wasn't living. I, like I said, I lost who I was during that period. I was gone. Caroline was gone. And there were a lot of times I contemplated like, what is the point in doing any of this anymore? I don't even want to get up and put one foot in front of the other. I don't care. And I want to say that like, my symptoms got pretty bad before I explanted, but they, I know women who are way worse off. I know women who legitimately think they feel like they are about to die. And I have known women who have died because of their breast implant illness, uh, breast implants like rupturing and leaking and killing them, actually killing them. So this is why I continue to talk about this because it's a very, very, very real subject. Um, it still affects me to this day. I'm still affected. I, I will never, for I'll, I can't, it's like COVID. Like I can't ever go back. I can't even go back to what it was before breast implant illness. It has changed who I am as a person. I, I am. I, I will say this: like I am grateful that I went through it and suffered from it because now I'm able to pass along this message and help other women realize that this could potentially happen eventually. If it's not, it could just no. Like just, I always like to plant the seed. Like I don't ever want any woman to have to go through this. So like what I went through. But I know right now that there's millions of women that are going through it. I know there's women who don't have a symptom at all. I hope they never get a symptom. But I, if they start experiencing any weird shit, like I want them to have at least heard me talk about this so that they're like, oh my gosh, you just know, just know, just educate. Um, it's, it's disturbing how lonely that cycle is if you don't have anyone to talk to. It's disturbing that there are medical professionals that don't believe you. It's disturbing that you get gaslit about it. It's disturbing that doctors will try to tell you that it's aging because it's not. I was told by a doctor that I was aging and that these were effects. I'm like, I'm not even 40. Go fuck yourself. I'm not, these, this isn't aging. And I knew deep down something was wrong. Like I said before in this episode, you know when something's off with your body, I knew something was wrong. So catch, getting up to the explant, September, uh, I explanted in September of 2020. I had gone to a surgeon in August to get, because my implants were 11 or 12 years old. So I was like, it's time to replace them. We had saved up money. I paid $11,000 
for my surgery, scheduled my surgery to put silicone. So I had saline and I was scheduled to put silicone implants in. And this was when like everything came to a head. I, the day of my pre-op, like five days before my surgery, I went to my pre-op and I just could not get this gut feeling out of my body. Like I, like it was literally so strong that it was like, don't do this, do not do this. But I couldn't explain why. And I told my nurse that I was experiencing, I was very on the fence and she was like, don't, don't undergo a major surgery if you're on the fence. Like just maybe like cancel and hold off and think about what you really want, which was the best advice I could have gotten. And I will forever be grateful for her for that because it changed my mind. And I went home and I, I remember being nervous about bringing it up to my husband. I was like, what, what if I just got him taken out? I remember laughing and making it a joke. I was like, what if I just took my boobs out? I just took them out, just didn't get new ones. And he was like, you just went to your pre-op today. What do you, are you nuts? And I was like, I just, I, what would you think? Would you be okay with it? This was back when, I mean, this wasn't that long ago, but like, I still was like, I needed that like validation. And now I've come so far. I feel like as a woman in the past two years, year and a half, really, honestly, since September of 2020, I have come so far as a woman. Like, I don't need anyone's approval for shit anymore. But at the time, I wanted approval from my husband. Did I need it? Not necessarily. And my husband is a stand-up man to where he, he didn't care. He was like, you know, at first he was very jarred and was like, I don't know, like, you were really flat before. But like, I've been with you before you had implants. I don't care. Like, if that's what you want to do, I will support it. So like, I, you know, I knew he would, whatever I wanted to do, I knew. He's never not supported me in anything I've wanted to do, ever. So I didn't have to worry about that. And a lot of women do. I've, I talk, I've talked to hundreds of women who are like, my husband won't let me do it. And I'm like, you don't want to know my opinion. Go fuck your husband. Get your implants out. Because I know the reality of how sick you can get. So I don't think, think. It's not your fucking body. So I, I have very strong opinions about if your husband doesn't want you to get your breast implants out because he likes the way they look or he thinks that they make you look more feminine, like go fuck yourself especially if you're experiencing symptoms and you don't feel good, like it's your body. Do what you want with it. It's not their body. So I knew I was going to do it regardless, but I having his support made a huge difference. And I'm thankful for that. Um, thank you, Pooh Bear. <laughs> and I canceled my surgery. Never forget, like two or three days after I canceled my surgery, I saw one of my friends who I knew really well. I worked with her at Hooters for years. She posted on Facebook and it was basically, she had like her drains in and she was like, I just explanted, I feel so much better. And I just, I don't know what it was, but I messaged her and I was like, you took your breast implant. Why'd you take your breast implants out? Tell me everything. We, it was 10 o'clock at night. Josh was asleep. I was in bed. I'll never forget. I was like laying. I remember where I was laying. And I was texting, messaging her. And I was just like, I wanted to know everything. And I couldn't out of nowhere. I just couldn't get enough information about it. And she was like, I feel so much better. I was struggling from this. And I'll never forget. I was like, well, I don't have all those symptoms, but I just, I kind of want to get them out. I don't know why, but I want them out. So this, you guys, this was literally three weeks before my explant. And I still was unaware that these symptoms that I was experiencing, all these crazy, crazy symptoms could be from having breast implants. And it was like, I'll never forget the day. It, it was the day I made a post. I made a post and I said, I've decided to get my breast implants out. I didn't even say anything about symptoms. I just was like, I haven't been feeling myself. Like I knew I wanted, I went off a gut instinct and canceled my surgery. I'm gonna go uh, undergo an explant. And when I posted that, so many women commented and they were like, huh, I've been really not feeling great. I wonder if that's related. Uh, I've been thinking about getting my implants out too. Just, and I started connecting dots very fast, like very quickly started connecting all, women started messaging me like crazy. Why are you getting your implants out? What made you wanna do it? I've been having, and I started like the dots that were connecting were like, I would hear them talk about symptoms that I was having. And I was like, oh my God. So it was, that was my light bulb moment. That was when I knew I was like, okay, I don't know how many of these symptoms are related. I don't know how many will go away if I explant or when I explant, but I'm going to do it. And I hope that, that I hope, I remember I had hope for the first time in three years. I was like, I have hope. Oh, I just remember almost jumping up and down me like that this could, uh, I could get my life back. I was like shaking. I could get my life. If, if this is somehow fucking related to these breast implants that are in my body and my symptoms go away, I could get my life back. I was so excited all of a sudden. 
it could not come fast enough. I had booked it originally for October of 2020. And when that light bulb went, moment went off and I just, I could, I was already on the train and I wanted them out. I wanted them out that day, yesterday. I called every day. I was like, give me, put me on the cancellation list. I want them out right now. We were in the middle of a move. We were getting ready to move into a mobile home. And I told my husband, he was like, wait until we get moved. And I was like, uh-uh, I can't. Please, let's make that. If you'll please, I'll do anything. Please make this work. Please, can I just, if they have a cancellation, can I just take it? And he was like, do whatever you need to do. We'll make it. We'll figure it out. It's like, okay. Again, like he supports everything I want to do no matter what. He, even the craziest of things. And they called me and they were like, it was September. It was like the first week of September. And they were like, we have an opening September 17th. And I was like, I'll take it. Two weeks. Oh my God. They're like, okay, come in for your pre-op next week. I was on top of the world. Well, COVID was already a thing. You know, COVID started in March of 2020. So I was terrified of like not passing a COVID test and not getting my surgery. Like I was so anxious leading up to the surgery. I just wanted them out of my body. I was like, just please, please, please let me get through the surgery and make it through the surgery, get them out of my body so I can heal. And I got them out September 17th, 2020. I'll never forget the date ever. And the second I woke up from surgery, I could breathe normally. I didn't really go over this, but I, I always had trouble breathing after I, when I had my implants. The, the shortness of breath started, I was never short of breath either, ever in my life until my, it was when I got pregnant with Kyler, I started noticing it was really bad, um, which you can get short of breath when you're pregnant. So I chalked it up to that, but then it never went away. And I had to actually have a rescue inhaler for a long time. Um, so I had dealt with, I just kind of got accustomed to being short of breath. When I woke up from surgery, I took a breath and I was like, oh, 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 I can breathe. It was the craziest feeling. Like I, I can take a full deep breath in without clenching my chest. Like I couldn't take a full breath ever, even if I did clench my chest prior to explanting. But when I explanted, I just will never forget that first breath I took. Like I was never able to do that before. My doctor at one point wanted to send me to like a pulmonologist. That's how bad it was. So there you go. Another symptom I just remembered. I'm going to remember lots. I can't believe I didn't print out all the symptoms. There was 20 to 25. And uh, a couple days after surgery, the color in my face, I never noticed. I guess my face was super red before I explanted. Just, I guess, got used to it. My chest was always real red right here. My face was flushed. My face, the redness went away within two days. I have pictures um of that 1244 uh yeah so the redness went away inflammation went down immediately i immediately felt just felt lighter if that makes sense i just felt better i overall just felt better after my surgery like something that was in my body that shouldn't have been there was out and I, my body felt like it could actually be like Oh my God, I can finally like take, I can finally take a breath. So it was what my body was doing when my body was literally deteriorating before my very eyes, not able to work out, not able to lift muscle loss, like no other. My body was literally eating away at itself. It was doing everything it could to fight these implants that were in there just to function day to day. And like I said, it gets so bad that women, you have no energy to do anything because your body is utilizing every fiber of its being just to keep you alive. And someone put this so well. They said, it's essentially you have plastic bags in your body, right? Well, what happens when you heat plastic up in a microwave? It breaks down and chemicals disperse from the plastic when you heat it up. You're putting implants into a warm body what do you think is happening as years go by? Chemicals are seeping into your body. Cigarette smell, bringing it back. When I was pregnant with Kyler, I woke up one morning, looked in my bathroom where in the house we were living at, and I said, it smells like someone's smoking a cigarette. Is, is our window open in our bathroom? Is there like a worker outside smoking? That's what it smelled like. Overwhelming. Not a whiff. It smelled like someone was standing in our bathroom smoking a cigarette. And Josh was like, I don't smell anything. And I was like, yes, you do. I was like, stop. Like, it is so strong. And he was like, I don't smell a thing. That was the weirdest thing. And I never in a million years knew what it was or thought, eh. but it would, it started to just come and go randomly. Like here and there, I just smell cigarette smoke. 
after I explanted and was talking about all this, a girl on my thread was like, oh my God, I can't believe, I'm so glad the cigarette smoke is gone now, the cigarette smoke smell. And I was like, that was related. Oh my God, it's like the chemicals. It's gone now. It it happened the year after I explanted, this past year, like it has happened almost every night, but it now does not happen anymore, finally. I don't roll over in the middle of the night and smell chemicals like smoke in my nose. That's another weird one. Anyway, um, so like I said, I instantly felt human again. And what happened the couple months after I explanted was wild. The progress with my body physically without really working out. I was working out maybe at 15 to 20% ex, um, like exertion my ass literally came back to the point where women were like, did you get butt implants? And I was like, no, I don't even know how this is happening. My body was able again to finally, I'm assuming muscle memory, it just came back. My body slowly started to come back around and I was not even putting out any effort. I really wasn't even following a diet, to be honest. Um, uh, so <laughs> I was just, I remember feeling so happy for the first time in a very long time. I felt like I had a zest for life. Now the healing process kind of did a number on me and I wanna talk about the healing process because if any of you are going to explant, have explanted, have just explanted, like this is what you need to know. You know, they say a good timetable is for however many years you had your explant or your implants in, expect one month for the healing process. So I had my implants in for 12 years. So I knew it would be a minimum of a year 12 months for me to fully heal. And my surgeon told me that because I remember at my week post-op appointment, I was like, I feel so good. I was almost crying. Dana was there with us and I was like, I feel so good. And he was like, it's only gonna get better. Like every week. And I just remember again, like I, for the first time in so long, I felt hope for my life. And I felt like I had my life back and I was getting it back. Now the healing process was very up and down. So like I would feel really good, no exaggeration, um, I've never smoked crack, but like I would imagine when people joke about smoking crack or doing Adderall that they get like this massive rush of energy. <laughs> I would literally have a day where I felt like I smoked crack. So much energy that I was like, I'm gonna do everything in the world today. For all those days, I couldn't do anything. For the, all those days that I laid in bed like a lifeless human, I'm gonna do everything today. So I'd go to the grocery store, I would meal prep, I would come to work, I'd go work out, I'd do extra cardio, I'd do all these things. And then the next day I would be in bed wiped and I'd be like oh my god and every time that happened I'd be like <gasps> like it, I mean I'm talking full-on PTSD oh my god oh my god my life isn't back oh my god I'm never gonna be healed from this oh my god why don't I just like die right now I'm never gonna have my energy back it's never gonna come back it's just part of the healing process so I say that in hopes to help someone else because I did not know that like it is up and down with healing and you can't go a thousand miles an hour two months after your explant and think that it's just gonna keep going. You're gonna, your body is getting back to where it's healthy again. It's it's a push and pull. It's not a light switch. It doesn't go back to just, let's go full steam ahead now. You've had these in your body for 13 years. You've now had breast implant illness, which it's a cancer of your immune system. It doesn't go back to normal immediately. It's gonna take time. And I wish I had known that. And there were people who told me, there were a couple of my friends who were like, stop pushing it. And I was like, I'm not listening. I'm gonna be different. And no, I wasn't different. I wasn't the exception. And I, so I, so again, up and down, but slowly my symptoms went away. So as I'm even trying to think of the symptoms I had before, the joint pain, I forgot about that the other day. I was telling someone like, I don't have joint pain anymore. Gone. And it was debilitating joint pain. I said a thousand times, I feel like I'm in a 90 year old woman's body now. Who am I? No joint pain, that's gone. My anxiety, and I will say the mood stabilizer has helped. I still had anxiety, um, but I always have. So I think getting on the mood stabilizer was inevitable. I'm glad I did finally, but the, I don't struggle. I can't even believe I'm sitting here saying this, but I don't really struggle with anxiety anymore. It comes and goes with COVID and normal, like scary shit, but overall, I don't go through the day feeling anxious like I did. And it was debilitating for a very long time. Not just regular anxiety, like heart palpitations all day. Uh, something's about to happen. Something bad is about to happen. I was on uh, fighter, I was in fight or flight every second of every day when I had my breast implant illness. Um, 
don't have depressive moods like that anymore really hair is thickening back up even my hairstylist yesterday was like dude you used to have like a bald spot right here and i was like it's coming back finally my hair is thickening again my hormones are fine i did go through some testing i had my hormones tested um i had i was actually like my a and a to iter levels were elevated about six months after I explanted and it freaked me out because my doctor was like, this is like indicative of Lyme disease, like not saying you have it, but it's like you're kind of on the spectrum. And I was like, and it freaked me out again. I was like, oh my God, what if this is irreversible? What if I now have Lyme disease? And oh my God. And no, everything, it just took time for it to level out. And I'm able, the biggest thing for me is I'm able to work out and feel good again. And it has taken so long, so long and arduous that it's like the most vindicating feeling I think I've ever had. Last week I said I got COVID. The week before COVID, for the first time in almost three years, I worked out five days in a row, hard, not stretching, not like light cardio, got in five workouts. Like I worked out, I did like two Metcons I have not been able to do a Metcon in three years. Just, I couldn't do it. Couldn't even do a round. A Metcon is three rounds. I was doing Metcons like three days a week before my breast implant illness with ease, with ease. Like I wasn't even getting tired. I would literally like keep pushing and do heavier weight. And I got to a point where I couldn't do those. I did two Metcons that two weeks ago, heavy. And then I worked out, trained, strength training three times, heavy weights, felt amazing for the first time in three years. It was the best feeling I've had in, I can't tell you how long. It was like, oh my God, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what I fought for. This is why I explanted. This is why I went through the healing process. I knew it was gonna take time, but realistically now I here I am, like not even a year and a half post explant. And I feel most of all, like I'm myself again. I'm me. I feel like I'm sitting here and I'm finally Caroline again. Am I where I wanna be physically yet? No, I am way far. I've lost a lot of my muscle. No, I don't want to say a lot. Muscle memory is real. I know when I get back in the gym and really start hitting it hard, it will come back, which is encouraging. But I, I have lost progress. I have. And I'm not happy right now with my body. I want it back and I'm going to get it back. That's like my goal for this year is I want to get back to where I feel really good about myself and my skin again. Um, and I'm going to do it because I now feel like I'm finally, I've been given the green light. I feel like someone has been like, had me tied up in a straight jacket for three years. And no matter how hard I try, I can't get out of it. Like, it's like mentally, I know what I want, but I can't physically do it. And I feel like someone has sliced that straight jacket open and I'm now able to like run free and do what I want again and enjoy life and work out and actually make progress and not have my muscle deteriorate before my very eyes as I'm lifting three, like when I was lifting, hip thrusting 300 pounds and my body was like deteriorating and I knew like, how am I lifting, how am I hip thrusting 300 pounds and my ass is going away? That, that doesn't make sense. That was my first, again, that's when I knew something was wrong. Like what the fuck is happening? And I, I, again, like just, I have my life back. Ultimately that I feel like I have my thoughts back. I feel like I have control over my thoughts. I have control over my body. I have energy for the first time in three years. I don't have to take days off and nap. I don't feel tired a lot ever really anymore. Um, I really don't. Um, the throat swallowing, I still like have a little bit of excess saliva. It's nothing that like is, bothers me too much day to day. Um, ear pain gone. I had actually gone to an ENT for that and they were like, I have no idea what's wrong with your ear. Nothing is wrong. I was like, but why does it feel full? This ear's fine. This ear feels full. Nope. Sent me to an audiologist and he was like, maybe it's your hearing. Nope. You hear a hundred percent better than anyone who comes in here. So again, I spent $300 to have them tell me nothing was wrong with my ear. When I explanted my ear pain immediately went away within a week, my ear pain was gone. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Oh, low libido, that was like standard for breast implant illness. That, I mean, obviously like that comes and goes. I feel like when you're married and have kids and a fucking farm and a business and life, <laughs> I'm not like wanting to have sex every fucking day, but libido is back to normal. Um, what else? No joint pain anymore at all. 
my bladder returned to normal. I went to the urologist a week before my explant and I was like, can you please, I was begging him. I said, please tell me that this could potentially have something to do with my implants. I said, I'm explanting next week. He wanted to put me on medication for overactive bladder because he diagnosed me with overactive bladder. It wasn't emptying. And he was like, I don't know. So I explanted and within a week I was peeing like a normal person again. Explain that. Just implant. I mean, the best the best way to explain this is just like all that inflammation that is built up, causing all these really random things to go about in your body. Like suddenly that inflammation has a chance to go away, and so then everything starts functioning at a normal, <laughs> and the way it should, like a regular human being. Um, I had a lot of girls say that they had like vision impairments. I never had vision impairments that I remember when I had that. So that was when I did not have. Um, I physically couldn't be around people. I, I, I could, I got to a point where I could not like listen to people talking at the grocery store. Like I would, I'd want to hurt them. Like I couldn't hear people talking and I'm not like that anymore. That has come back. Um, I can actually have conversations without wanting to hurt people now. That was a really weird one. And I know that a lot of women have said the same thing. Um, you just don't have the capacity to speak. It's like you, it's like, you know, you're sick and no one believes you, but you know that something is going on in your body that you don't have the capacity to have everyday conversations. You don't have the capacity for small talk. Like something's going on, you want it fixed, but no one knows what it is. No one can help you. You feel alone, you feel scared, you feel crazy. And so going to the grocery store and having someone to try to talk to you about the weather, you're just like, shut the fuck up. Like I just want my life back and no one can help me. Like I remember that's the way I felt all day, every day. So I wouldn't have conversations with people. I would get very irritable if someone even tried to approach me and talk to me. And this, like coming, I was introverted. So I'm like, yeah, this is probably just exacerbated. I have extroverted friends who also had breast implant illness and they said the same thing. They were like, dude, this is not like me. I don't even want to talk to anybody. I'm like, yeah, I had the same thing. Uh, um, what else? All right. I think I covered everything. Um, I, feel, I still feel like I'm not mentioning some of my symptoms and I know the second I hit stop on this I'm going to fucking remember all of them I'm going to try to go real quick and list them trouble swallowing I'm going to list them in chronological order from when they began trouble swallowing excessive coughing clearing of throat ear pain feeling muffled overactive bladder never being able to empty my bladder like feel going to pee 50 times a day and never having it fully empty. Joint pain, debilitating joint pain. Mine was in my elbows and my knees, sometimes my shoulders. Feeling heavy all the time, exhausted, full on fatigue, like flu-like exhaustion. Go to the gym, feel like I got the flu for three days. Could not work out. Got to the point where I couldn't lift weights, couldn't do anything. Body literally eating away at itself, losing my physique, quite literally. Flat, everything, muscle, gone. No matter what I did, no matter what I ate, no matter how little or much I ate, my body did not change. It stayed the same. Anxiety, debilitating anxiety, heart palpitations, suicidal thoughts, depression, scary thoughts, always feeling like something bad was going to happen. Intolerable, like not being able to be around, not wanting to even talk to people. Don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Um, I would just say general irritability. Mood swings, low libido, nausea. I got to a point where I, wouldn't, I wasn't even eating dinner like six months before my explant. I Just pure nausea every single night. I feel like that covers most of it. I'll probably remember more. Anyway, um, and then the last one that was really, really scary <laughs> happened right before I explained. I don't know why I'm laughing. I woke up in the middle of the night, thought someone was choking me, and that was when I thought this was the end. Um, felt like someone had their hands around my neck. And it was like, Sometimes I wouldn't be able to swallow unless I thought about it, if that makes sense. Like, it was like, okay, I need to stop and like think about how to swallow. Like my body just wouldn't allow me to swallow sometimes. It was really weird. But then I woke up in the middle of the night and I felt like someone had their hands around my neck. And I was like, oh my God, I woke my husband up and I was like, I can't breathe. It feels like something's like right here. And he was like, what, what? Like, and that happened twice before I explanted. And it did happen once or twice after I explanted, but then it went away and I, it hasn't, God, thank God it hasn't happened again. That was so fucking scary. <clears throat> really scary. And just the sensation that you're being choked is like the scariest thing in the world. Um, so anyway, that those were my symptoms. 99% of my symptoms are completely gone 
15, 16 months post explant, gone. I have my life back and I want more than anything to continue to spread awareness about this. Um, if you or anyone you know or think of is could be struggling with this, I always say, please send them my way, send them to my Instagram and my DMs. That's where most women contact me is Instagram. Um, leave a comment on this video if you feel comfortable doing that. If not, like, you, I mean, I have my link tree here in the notes section. You can literally email me and I check my email every day. Um, this is a huge part of my life now. And it, I, I feel like it took something away from me. I mean, it took my life away from me for so long and it robbed me of years. It robbed me of so many times that I could have been spending time with my kids and I couldn't because I was in bed because I physically couldn't get out of bed. And it robbed me of moments that I could have had with my kids because I was so concerned about the suicidal thoughts or worrying about what was gonna happen to me or not being able to control my thoughts. And I get angry when I think about that because it's, like I said, I can't get that time back, but I'm thankful that I went through it. I'm thankful that I have explanted and I am feeling a thousand percent better. And now I'm hopefully able to help more women um, like me who didn't have a voice and didn't have anyone to talk to. I would have given anything if I had known what it was and then had like someone to confide in and just talk to about it. Cause then I don't think I would have felt as crazy. And I don't, you know, it's it's so comforting when you feel like you know what someone else is going through that you're also going through. There's no other feeling like it because it gives you that like, oh my gosh, not only am I not crazy, but there could be a fix to this. There could be something that like I could do to get my life back and you know, maybe not die. Like, again, like I'm not being dramatic, like it kills women. And the fact that we're still even fucking putting them in women's bodies is so stupid to me. I've gone the complete other way with it. Like, I think they're so unnecessary. I think they're so, like society made us believe that we needed them to look more feminine or more sexy or like a porn star or whatever and that's why I got mine I wanted I was like I want these big boobs like and now like I, if I could go back and do it all over I mean I probably wouldn't because I never have regrets it's brought me here but I don't I don't know why society makes us think we need them because they do society makes us think oh bigger boobs oh look at that cleavage oh it the way that it's promoted in movies and sex and porn and all that shit it's such bullshit like it's not worth your life it's not worth your health like it it's not worth any, just, I would be completely flat. If someone told me today that like, I'd have to go have a double mastectomy, I wouldn't care. I, I wouldn't, I would not care. I would literally like have them taken away completely and I would tattoo my chest. I would not care. And I never would have said that before. Like I was worried about being flat chested and looking like a boy again. I got called mosquito bites in school over and over and over. That is another thing. Like I got made fun of because I was the girl that did not have boobs. So when I was in my 20s, I was like, I'm getting boobs. There was a huge part of it. The, the fun, the making fun and the poking fun of girls, like, I mean, that led to my insecurities and making me want to get breast implants. And then you're not properly informed. I think they are properly informing now more. I mean, since the FDA put the black box label warning on all implants, um, that has been huge. That was a huge step in the right direction. It is catching steam like it's building steam a lot more people are talking about it a lot more doctors are being open to it because you can't ignore it you know when this many women are having these actual experiences like I've said before this is data like women getting an explant and feeling better is data you cannot ignore data so when enough of this starts happening like doctors will not be able to look the other way you're gonna have to acknowledge that like it it's real. <laughs> like 10,000 women get their implants out and they are healed when they were super sick before and no one knew why. You can't ignore that. <laughs> like there's something to this. So anyway, I, yep, I said this was going to be an hour and a half. Um, I'm going to stop here. I hope I didn't forget anything. Dear God, I know I spent the first 45 minutes talking about like just my life, <laughs> but I feel like I had to lead it up to it because ultimately I, I do feel like I have like just even with being able to work out, it's it's helping with my mental state and it's helping with my energy and it's helping with my anxiety that I still sometimes have. And it's I'm able to have that. I, I have that back. I have that ability and I didn't have it and I didn't know if I would ever get it back. I thought that was just my life and I was really upset and saddened about it for a very long time. But I 
you don't have to suffer alone. Again, I'm always, always, always here. I am on social media every day. That's my job. I love it. I love talking to women about breast implant illness. However, I can help. I want to help. So um, I would eventually love to actually speak publicly about this as well. So if anyone's watching and you have like a contact or like a in somewhere with someone, like maybe a local news station, I always appreciate help in connecting people. I, I do would eventually love to speak publicly about this. So anyway, that's it. I hope you guys have a are having a wonderful week. I hope you do not have COVID right now. I feel like everyone has COVID right now, which hopefully that will, it's a milder strain. So everybody will get it, not be as sick. And then we can eventually reach endemic status and it be like, just like a seasonal thing. Like ultimately I think that's what we're all hoping for right now so that we can return to some sort of normalcy for our lives. Please God. <laughs> so anyway, that's it. Um, I'm not going to drag this into an hour and 40 minutes. I will see you guys next time. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for checking out the CWC podcast. If you want to learn more about our community, make sure to check out the show notes.